Yeah, this is the first of, of a series that you're doing, and it's my uh, duty to look at the first two chapters tonight, which really deal with um, the message that Amos is sent by God to deliver, firstly to nations that surround Israel, and then beginning to look at the um, the nation of Israel itself. So let's just think about um, what we hope to to think about this evening. I want us to to just think about the the background to this book, um, just to try and understand a little bit more about who Amos was, where he was, when he was there, uh, just to get the context and the, and the background, so that for the next four weeks you understand um, who he's talking to and why and when. And, and see what his message is in, in a bit more detail. Because I think hopefully as I'll show, of course, this is a historical record, but it's actually very relevant for us uh, today in our walk towards the kingdom. And then lastly, and perhaps more importantly, for me at least, you know, when I come to look at something like this that might seem like an old and depressing book, judgments of, of God upon Israel and the waywardness of his people, I have to think, well, what, what does it mean for me? What what does it tell me that I can learn and, and hopefully apply in my own life? And so hopefully, as we go through this this evening, I will put on the screen some, some blue boxes just to hopefully bring out for us some lessons that we can we can make this a practical um, class for ourselves, not just a history lesson as we look at the, the nation of Israel and Amos. So just by way of overview, just so that you can perhaps understand how the, the book is structured, and this really um, follows how you've got it set up for your next four weeks at rugby. Um, when, when Brother Jonathan's put the, the, the plan together, he's broadly followed this uh, structure, and, and I'm so therefore dealing with the first of the three boxes on the screen there. This is chapters one and two, the message uh, to the nations and Israel. And towards the end of chapter two, that, that message to Israel starts and it carries on then for the next four chapters afterwards, three, four, five and six, which I believe Brother Alan uh, Clark will be dealing with next week for you, God willing. And then chapters seven, eight and nine are some visions of Amos that uh, show the coming judgments of God on um, Israel. And I think for me, if I was to kind of on, on this one slide, kind of give give the overall message I would like to take out of the book of Amos, and perhaps the, f the first lesson for us, it would be found in chapter 5 and verse um, 24. Right in the middle of the book, we see this lovely verse, which I think is really the whole aim and purpose of God in, in, re in requesting Amos to visit his, his people of Israel and give this message he says there in chapter 5 and verse 24 let judgment run down as waters and righteousness as a mighty stream and just turn um, brothers and sisters and young people keep a mark in amos of course goes without saying we'll be spending most of our time there just turn back to the, to the psalms just to to see what this really means this idea of judgment and righteousness or justice, as the word means, really, justice and righteousness. Come to Psalms and Psalm 89, firstly. Psalm 89, we see that this is the very centre of God's being. Psalm 89 and verse 14, he says there, Justice and judgment are the habitation of thy throne. Mercy and truth shall go before thy face. So here we see then it's the, the habitation of God's throne. And so just turn over to another psalm, Psalm 97, Psalm 97 and verse 2. Verse 1 for connection, the Lord reigneth, let the earth rejoice, let the multitude of isles be glad thereof. Clouds and darkness are round about him. Righteousness and judgment are the habitation of his throne. And that word habitation there is the same word as foundation in Psalm um, 89. We see that no matter how wayward the world is around us, just as we'll see these nations were in the time of Amos, no matter how wicked we see the world around us, 
God will prevail. Judge, just judgment or justice and righteousness are his plan and purpose with this earth. And time and time again, he reminds us of that. Uh, and in your own time, while you're in the Psalms, have a look at Psalm 72, a very well-known Psalm, I know. But just think about that Psalm when you, when you look at Amos, that righteousness and, and justice are the centre of David's hope as he pens his closing words there in Psalm 72. So albeit most of our chapters this evening are, are, are rather gloomy in the sense that there are judgments on Israel and the nations around them, at the centre of this book, we see this aspect of, of justice and, and righteousness. And so then just to set the background, Amos, we know, if we come back to Amos in chapter one, we see Amos there, his, the words of Amos, who was among the herdsmen of Tekoa, which he saw concerning Israel in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, two years before the earthquake. And we know that Amos, is, his name means um, burden bearer, burden bearer. And sadly, brothers and sisters and, and young people, all too often, um, indeed, the word of God was a burden to his people. And this, this book is a message of continuous judgment and denunciation of his people for their waywardness. Yes, as we see there in the days of, of Jeroboam. And we'll have a look a bit shortly at just how wayward they were. But in terms of this word of, of God being a burden, just come back to, to Jeremiah. And we'll just look at two examples, one in Jeremiah and one in Malachi. Because, as I say, sadly, it was the case, was it, time and time again, that God would send a prophet to his people, appealing to them, to repent and turn back to him. And time and time again, they just viewed his word as a burden. Jeremiah 23 here then in the time of Jeremiah, verse 33. This is many years after um, Amos, but still shows just how these prophets had to deal with God's backsliding people. Um, Jeremiah 23, verse 33. He says, um, when this people or the prophet or a priest shall ask thee, saying, what is the burden of the Lord? Thou shalt say unto them, what burden? I will even forsake you, saith the Lord. And as for the prophet and the priest and the people that shall say the burden of the Lord, I will even punish that man and his house. Thus shall ye say every one to his neighbour and every one to his brother. What hath the Lord answered and what hath the Lord spoken? And the burden of the Lord shall be meant, shall ye mention no more, for every man's word shall be his burden. For he have perverted the words of the living God, of the Lord of hosts, our God. And so there's just one example. And as I said, let's just go forward then to Malachi, to the end of the Old Testament, and, and see it again. Because unfortunately, even in the time of Malachi here, in chapter 1, well-known words, the, the opening verse of Malachi chapter 1, again, 250 years after Amos, but we see that it was the burden of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. And what about us, brothers and sisters? As I say, how is this relevant to us? When, when we open the pages of scripture, are we, are we challenged by them? Are they, are they a burden to us as we see the world around us and the, the, the freedoms they have and the opportunities they have to do as they please? Does the word of God become a burden to us? Well, Let's just think of what the Lord Jesus Christ had to say to us, brothers and sisters, as he led his life at all times following the will of his father. He was able to say that his yoke is easy and his burden is light in Matthew 11 there on the screen, Matthew 11, verse 28 to 30. And so may it be as we come to approach this, this book of Amos that we don't see this as a burden to us brothers and sisters rather remembering that through the love and the mercy of God through his son we have an easy yoke and a light burden as we have our sins forgiven and a hope of eternal life through him and so back in Amos as I said uh, verse 1 tells us that he was um, we get the idea that he was a shepherd he says it there in verse 1 of chapter 1 he was among the herdsmen of Tekoa 
And again, if you just turn to chapter seven, which you'll cover in uh, uh, next week, um, chapter seven and verse um, 14, you see there um, when Amos is speaking, he says, I was no prophet, neither was I a prophet's son, but I was an herdsman and a gatherer of sycamore fruit. So there we have two, two, two verses telling us that um, Amos was uh, a shepherd. And so he, he didn't have any kind of academic background or, or religious um, scholarship as such. He was a humble shepherd among the herdsmen. But God had a plan and a purpose for him. And of course, it's not the first time, is it, in, in Scripture that um, God uses a shepherd for his purpose. We think of Abel, we think of Abraham there, uh, Jacob, Moses, David, all examples of, of shepherds who were used by God to, to fulfill his plan or to pass on his message. And of course, we think of the Lord God himself um, in, in Isaiah. Um, we won't turn there now, but on the screen, you have the reference in Isaiah chapter 40. And again, as well in Psalm 80, just two examples where time after time, the Lord God himself is, is called a shepherd, the, the true shepherd of Israel that cared for his flock, cared for his children and would time, as we've said, time after time, appeal to them to return to him and his love and his mercy to them. And of course, what about us, brothers and sisters? Well, the Lord Jesus Christ saw his disciples, saw us, doesn't he? And as he says there in Mark 6, Jesus, when he came out, saw much people and was moved with compassion toward them because they were a sheep not having a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. And so just as Christ did, did that with his disciples, God here in the time of Amos realized the need for his people to have a shepherd to try and bring them together and return them to his fold. And so he, he chooses Amos, this, this herdsman of Tekoa. Humanly speaking, Amos was, was a nobody. He was just a humble shepherd, but he would leave that behind and follow God's bidding to speak to his children of Israel. And we know, don't we, that he lived in Tekoa. Chapter 1, verse 1 there, a herdsman of Tekoa. And interestingly, if we put a map on the screen, you can see there on the screen where Tekoa is. And if I just uh, plot there a rough drawing of the, the kingdom, of the southern kingdom of Judah, you see straight away that Tekoa was actually in the southern kingdom of Judah, which had Uzziah as its king, as it says there in verse one. So Amos lives down in Judah, but he's requested by God to go north, to go into the kingdom of Israel, who at this time were under the hand of King Jeroboam. And so it seems that Amos does follow uh, God's call and makes that journey north and seems to spend most of his time around the area of, of Bethel. And um, that's where he goes. And, and we know that Israel had set up um, two centers of religious worship at the time, one in the north in Dan and one in the south in Bethel. And so Amos goes to the southernmost one, which is only about 15 miles from where he, he lived himself, albeit over the border into Israel. But unfortunately, as would perhaps be expected, that they saw his message as a burden. He was met with, with much resistance. And this really culminates, just to come back against chapter 7. Uh, chapter 7, and here we see the opposition he faced is, is, it's ironically sad, really, that it's a priest, Amaziah, who tells him, verse 12, he says, O thou seer, go, flee, flee away into the land of Judah, and there eat bread and prophesy there. But prophesy not again any more at Bethel, for it is the king's chapel and it is the king's court. And so we see poor Amos, just like we saw with Jeremiah and with Malachi, his words were met with resistance. They were a burden to the hearers. And it's thought perhaps that he actually went back into Judah when he penned some of his words as he 
was in, instructed there by this priest Amaziah. So we'll come back to that map uh, again, brothers and sisters, as it's, it's, it's relevant when we start to look at the, the chapter one in more detail. So in terms of the timeline, we said there, didn't we, that Uzziah was the king of Judah and Jeroboam II was king in Israel. And so we can gather that this prophecy was written around the time of BC 760 uh, to 750 or, or 755. And it's indeed the first prophecy um, that is sent directly to Israel. In, in our scriptures, this book appears as the, the third minor prophet in our Bibles, um, but indeed um, it is the, the first in the sense of chronology um, that was sent directly to the nation of Israel. Jonah, of course, was earlier, but he was sent to, to other nations, not directly to God's people, Israel. And so just to, just to kind of help you, if you haven't got this uh, trusty uh, Christadelphian chart that I think everybody should have in their Bibles if they haven't got it already, this is where we find Amos. He was, as we see there, um, contemporary with Hosea during the time of Jeroboam and the time of Uzziah in the Southern Kingdom. And, and interestingly, when we look at Hosea, um, which I, I have looked at before, when I came to look at Amos, you do see some connections and we'll, we'll bring out a few of those in the way that they speak and the, and the message that they have for God's wayward people. As of course, not long after these prophets, he subjects them to this Assyrian um, captivity. Uh, not only 40 years after this time, um, God would, would deliver them up. We see there then interestingly in verse one, that it was two years before the earthquake. And when I was looking into this, I was interested to find that um, Josephus actually refers to this. It's referred to elsewhere in scripture, which we'll look at in a second, but just to just to show what Josephus says about that, that there, there was this earthquake in the time of Isaiah, um, that half the mountain break off from the rest, and the roads as well as the king's gardens were, were spoiled by the obstruction. And just turn to um, Zechariah, you'll probably see that references in your margin in your Bible. Um, just come to Zechariah chapter 14. Here he's talking, of course, looking forwards to the return of the Lord Jesus Christ, it's a very exciting time. And he compares it to this earthquake in the time of Amos, um, Zechariah 14 and verse 5. He says, Ye shall flee to the valley of the mountains, for the valley of the mountains shall reach unto Azal. Yea, ye shall flee like as ye fled from before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. And the Lord my God shall come, and all the saints with thee. And we won't go into more detail of Zechariah 14, but it's interesting there that we have this, this reference. I don't think it's it's really reference too much else in scripture this, this earthquake in the time of Uzziah I'd be interested if you have more detail on it but that's as much as I could could find out about it really in, in my own um, studies but I think it's interestingly interesting for us and hopefully for you for the next three or four weeks that you can pick out this as you read through the rest of this book this this earthquake does seem to be alluded to um, throughout throughout the rest of the book for example, in chapter 3 and verse 14, we see there that I will, um, in, the, in the middle of the verse, I will visit the altars of Bethel and the horns of the altar shall be cut off and fall to the ground. Verse um, 15, I will smite the winter house and the summer house and the houses of ivory shall perish and the great houses shall have an end, saith the Lord. In chapter 8 and verse 8, um, just flick over the page, you see there that there's a reference, uh, an inference to um, the land trembling, shall not the land tremble for this, and everyone mourn that dwelleth therein. And then as well then in chapter 9 and verse 1, we see the Lord stand upon the altar, and he said, smite the lintel of the door, and the post may shake, and cut them in the head, all of them, and I will slay the last of them with the sword. And so I think it's interesting as you read through the book, you can see a few inferences to, to an earthquake, perhaps. I'm, I wouldn't be uh, dogmatic on any of those uh, references, but 
I thought it was interesting as I read through to, to think back to chapter one, verse one. And I think as well, um, I won't go there now for time, but in your own time, have a look at Isaiah chapter 21. He was a prophet that was contemporary with, with uh, Isaiah as well. And I think if you read Isaiah 21, um, you see a lot of allusions to an earthquake there um, as well. But again, I wouldn't be dogmatic on, on, on any of, of that. I thought it was just of note. And so lastly, as we just consider the background to this whole prophecy, I just thought it would be useful to, to think about how society was at that time in the divided kingdom, because I think this really is relevant to us, uh, brothers and sisters. Come to, to 2 Kings chapter 14, because here we have the historical record of Jeroboam, as I say, who was this, this king of the northern kingdom of Israel at the time of Amos. 2 Kings chapter 14 and verse 23 says there in the 15th year of Amaziah, the son of Joash, king of Judah, Jeroboam, the son of Joash, began king of Israel, began to reign in Samaria, and he reigned 40 and one years. And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. He departed not from all the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin. He restored the coast of Israel from the entering of Hamath and to the sea of the plain, according to the word of the Lord of Israel, which he spake by his hand of the servant Jonah, the son of Amittai, the prophet, which was of Gath Hepha. For the Lord saw the affliction of Israel, that it was very bitter, for there was not any shut up, nor any left, nor any helper for Israel. And so what a sad state of affairs, brothers and sisters. We see that Jeroboam made Israel to sin. The nation was so wayward that there was not any helper for Israel. So despite this prosperity, humanly speaking, that Jeroboam brought in enlarging the nation and, and, and dealing with nations around him and, and, and making Israel prosper, unfortunately, spiritually, they were completely wayward and sinful and were without help. But there's quite a contrast if we come to Second of Chronicles, quite a contrast with the kingdom of Israel. And again, I think the reason I'm looking at this with you is because, of course, this is where Amos was uh, originally when he was at home in Tekoa. He was here in the time of, of Uzziah, the nation of Judah, uh, were found to be prospering in chapter 26 of Second Chronicles and verse 3. 16 years old was Uzziah when he began to reign, and he reigned 50 and two years in Jerusalem. His mother's name also was Jechaliah of Jerusalem, and he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father Amaziah did. And he brought Israel in the days of Zechariah, sorry, he sought God in the days of Zechariah, who had understanding in the visions of God. And as long as he sought the Lord, God made him to prosper. Verse 7, God helped him against the Philistines, against the Arabians, etc etc so you have this contrast you have Jeroboam in the north Israel had no helper here we have Uzziah in in Judah and God helped him because as long as he sought God God made him to prosper so we have quite a contrast here in the life of Amos that he leaves behind Judah and goes north to Israel to this wicked and wayward society and let's just see come back to, to Amos um, and let's just see how God saw the society of the northern kingdom of, of Israel under Jeroboam. Chapter 2 and verse 6, we see there, there were many crimes, three transgressions or four is this phrase that's used time and time again against the nations uh, in, in chapter 1 and then in chapter 2 verse 6, speaking to Israel. He says, for three transgressions of four, I will not turn away the punishment. So we get this idea of a host of a multitude of wickedness and wicked acts. Again, chapter um, two, verse six, they, they sold the righteous as slaves. We see chapter two, verse seven, the immorality of the people. We see them profaning the Nazarite vow in chapter two, verse 12. We see them in chapter three, verse 10, 
violent and, and robberies taking place in this nation. We see them in chapter 4 and verse 1, oppressing the poor. They crush the needy, as it says there. They turn to idolatry in chapter 5 and verse 26. You have borne the tabernacle of your Molech and chewing your images, the star of your God, which ye made to yourselves. Can't be plain, I can't the language used there, your God, not, not that I am your God. We see the, the lavish lifestyle that they have there. They lie upon beds, chapter 6 of ivory. They drink wine in bowls, verse 6 of chapter 6. And sadly, verse 10 of chapter 7, the land is not able to bear the words of God as Amos speaks to them. And then just lastly, in chapter 8 and verse 4, they're found to be, again, exploiting the poor. You swallow up the needy, even to make the poor of the land to fail. What a list, brothers and sisters, as we go through this book of, of Amos. What a depraved and wicked place it was. And Amos is sent to try and deliver this nation, these people, try and turn their hearts back to God. And what about us, brothers and sisters, when we think about the day in which we live? We've seen there the, the depravity of Israel, the wickedness, the fact that they were violent, that they were immoral, that they were living a, a fairly prosperous and lavish lifestyle. Well, what, what does Christ warn us, brothers and sisters, in Luke chapter 17? He says, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it also be in the days of the Son of Man. They did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage. Also in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. And I think that is a very succinct description of the nation of Israel here in the time of Jeroboam that Amos goes to. Just how, how wayward they were. But nonetheless, brothers and sisters, a lesson for ourselves as we strive to think of what those words of Christ mean to us. We look out of our windows on a daily basis. We, we look online. We, we see the news. The world around us, brothers and sisters, is exactly like the nations were, the nation of Israel were in the time of Amos. Surely that our deliverance is, is near, that God will send his son just as he sent the flood in the days of Noah, just as he abolished the city of Sodom and Gomorrah in the time of Lot. And so we come to chapters one and two in a bit more detail. We see there, don't we, that Amos saw the word of God, chapter one and verse one. The words of Amos, who was among the children of herdsmen of Tekoa, which he saw concerning Israel in the days of Uzziah. And again, in your own time, compare that with with John and again with John himself in, in Revelation, in his epistle there, first epistle of John chapter one and in Revelation, the fact that God's word is is, is almost tangible, that it's, that it's a real thing and that it is so important to us and to, to our understanding of him and his purpose with this earth. And we get this idea that God will roar from Zion. Verse two, he says, the Lord will roar from Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem and the habitations of the shepherd shall mourn and the top of Carmel shall wither. And this um, is an interesting phrase, brothers and sisters, this idea of, of God roaring like a lion almost. You see there in Joel, the Lord also shall roar out of Zion. It's on the, on the same page uh, in, in your Bible, probably Joel 3, verse 16. The Lord shall roar out of Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem and the heavens and the earth shall shake. For the Lord will be the hope of his people and the strength of the children of Israel. Hosea 11. I said there's quite a few similarities with Hosea. Here's one of them. Hosea 11, that they shall walk after the Lord and he shall roar like a lion. Isaiah chapter 31, like as a lion roaring on his prey, so shall the Lord of hosts come. And just turn to this one, brothers and sisters, in Isaiah in chapter 58. 
Isaiah 58, because I think this links in quite nicely with what we're looking at here in Amos. Isaiah 58 and verse 1. Cry aloud. So we have this idea of, of, of roaring and crying. Spare not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet and show my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sins. Yet they seek me daily and delight to know my ways as a nation that did righteousness and forsook not the ordinance of their God. They ask me the ordinances of justice. They take delight in approaching to God. So again, here we have this idea of justice, judgment and, and righteousness with Isaiah. The same idea of God um, coming in, in vengeance and just uh, to deliver justice and righteousness for his people. And again, this is picked up in, in uh, later in, in Amos, surely verse 7. Chapter 3, verse 7 of Amos. Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he revealeth his secret unto his servants, the prophets. The lion hath roared, who will not fear? The Lord God hath spoken, who can but prophesy? And so God will roar as a lion and the people will hear him, whether they like it or not. And he will deliver judgment upon them, that ultimately justice and and righteousness will prevail in his nation, in his chosen people. I think it's interesting. I've just put there on the screen the whole of chapters one and two, and I don't expect you to be able to read that, but it's just to show that 52 times in Amos, we have this phrase that God will. He says, I will, or that the Lord will. I put them there in green in these first two chapters. And if you, if you colour them in like, like I have, it really begins to stand out on the page. This idea of the certainty of God's word, the sheer single-mindedness that God has when he's dealing with his people, that there's no ambiguity or, or doubt. The Lord's will is final and he knows the end from the beginning and what he purposes will be performed he doesn't say i might he doesn't say maybe he doesn't say perhaps he says i will time and time and time again and maybe you can follow that through if you find all 52 in the next four weeks you've done very well um, i haven't got all of them here now with me but you can uh, try and find them as you go through your studies in the next few weeks this idea of the, the certainty of god's word this is a warning to us brothers and sisters just as it was a warning to the nation of Israel, that God is in control and his purpose will be performed. We mentioned um, Psalm 72 earlier in the context of righteousness and judgment. And, and that's the same, brothers and sisters. David there in Psalm 72 uses the word shall um, some 29 times. There's no doubt that God will, God shall deliver his people there's no doubt that he will send his son back to this earth there's no doubt that he will give us eternal life in his kingdom if we are found to have followed his commands what a wonderful blessing that is brothers and sisters that we we see the the u-turns that today's governments make on a daily basis the the backsliding and the the waywardness and the lack of direction that men's leaders have today that's not the case with our father, brothers and sisters. What he has promised, he will perform. And so here's the lesson for us in connection with this, the, the words of the prophet Isaiah in chapter 46, verse 9. Remember the former things of all, for I am God, there is none else. I am God, there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, the things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will do my pleasure calling a ravenous bird from the east, the man that executed my counsel from a far country. Yea, I have spoken it. I will also bring it to pass. I have purposed. I will also do it. And so, brothers and sisters, let's remember the purpose of our Lord God Almighty as we're looking at these pages together. So we stated, didn't we, that this is a prophet, prophecy to Israel, but 
of course, um, the subject of our of our class this evening is to the nation, the, the message to the nations and to Israel. And the whole of chapter one and some of chapter two is dealing with the message of God to six nations that surround Israel. And we'll look at that uh, now. Interestingly, we see this phrase, the first time it's used uh, in, is in verse three. He says there, for three transgressions and four, I will not turn away the punishment thereof because they have threshed Gilead with threshing the instruments of iron. This is in the case of, of, of Damascus. But each nation has this phrase used of them, for three transgressions and four. And it's interesting, isn't it, that um, it made me think of, of Proverbs 30, where um, the, the writer in Proverbs there says, three things are, one, are too wonderful for me, yea, four which I knew not. And you, you might think of those examples yourself in Proverbs 30. And, and I, I was reading um, into this a little bit more, and I thought what Brother Fred Pierce said about this is quite useful. Um, he says here that the repeated formula for three transgressions and four it doesn't imply that there were, in fact, seven transgressions. It's not a case of adding the three and the four together. In Hebrew, a threefold repetition is final. And he quotes there the example in Ezekiel of, of overturn, 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 i.e. there would be, a, 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 it's, it's, it's complete. And so three would have been a full transgression. So four is therefore an excess. In other words, there is no question that these nations merit the judgment of God. And so I think that's a useful way of, of interpreting what this phrase means there, these three transgressions or four. They, the time had come that God would, would deal with these nations and indeed with Judah and with Israel, as we'll see later in this prophecy. And the fact that the six surrounding nations, I'm sure it's not a coincidence either, is it, brothers and sisters, when we think of the, the significance of the number six, the idea of flesh, of, of human weakness. Of, of sinful, wicked um, human flesh. And so, firstly, then, he deals with the nation of uh, Syria to the north. He uses Damascus there as the city in, in verses 3 to 5. He deals with um, uh, the, the wickedness of Syria. And we find that this was indeed fulfilled. Um, you can make a note of that reference in Second Kings. Um, after Amos, some 50 years later, um, that these judgments did come to pass. And we see, again, interestingly, each of these judgments on all of these nations involves the use of uh, fire. We see it in verse 4, I will send fire into the house of Hezael, which shall devour the palaces of Ben-Hadad. He then moves on in verse um, 6 to 8 to deal with the judgments on the Philistines. He uses the, the, the town there of Gaza in verse 6. For three transgressions of Gaza and for four, I will not turn away the punishment thereof. And we see the, the wickedness of, of that nation. And we learn that during Sennacherib's in, invasion of Judah, some Jews did indeed flee to, to Philistine cities. But instead of them giving hospitality to them, they sold them um, to the Edomites. And again, this, um, this uh, prophecy against uh, the Philistines was fulfilled under the hand of uh, Sennacherib, the Syrian invasion, and again later by Egypt under Pharaoh Necho. And again, as we said in verse 7 this time, we see fire used in judgment against this nation of Philistia. The next nation is Tyre in, in verses 9 uh, to 10. And we see the same charge um, is laid against them as it is against the Philistines. Um, you have, they delivered up the captivity to Edom, remembered not the brutally covenant. I will send a fire on the walls of Tyre, which shall devour the palaces thereof. And we see... You just turn back to the previous prophecy in your, in your Bibles of Joel, uh, Joel chapter 3, verse 6. This is again talking to Tyre, verse um, 4. What have you to do with me, O Tyre, and all the coasts of Palestine? Verse um, 5, you've taken my silver and gold. Verse 6, 
The children also of Judah and the children of Jerusalem have you sold unto the Grecians that you might remove them far from their border. So we see the, the connection there with the prophecy of Joel, what these people had done, um, just as the Philistines had done. They, they, uh, they dealt with God's people in the same way. And so the, sure enough, the nation of Tyre was firstly sacked by the Assyrians, and then it was dealt with by Nebuchadnezzar, and then finally by the Greeks, some 400 years after Amos. Nevertheless, God's will and word is sure, and it did indeed uh, get destroyed. And again, fire used there in verse 10 in the purpose of God's judgment. The fourth nation is Edom in verses 11 to 12, for three transgressions of Edom and for four. And we get this word used, he said, verse, verse four, because he did pursue his brother with the sword and did cast off all pity and his anger did tear perpetually and he kept his wrath forever. And again, I think time is going quickly. So in your own time, uh, make a note and, and follow that up, the idea of Edom, going back to the time of Esau in Genesis, Genesis 27. And then again, picked up by Moses in, in Numbers, this idea of the brother, Edom being the brother of Israel. And again, Joel tells us in, in Joel 3 and verse 19 that they, um, Edom shall be a desolate wilderness for the violence against the children of Judah because they have shed innocent blood in their land. This was the description of the, the wickedness of Edom. And so God again would judge them and send destruction upon them. Fifth, nation in verses 13 to 15 is Ammon and they um, it seems committed uh, atrocities in, in enlarging their territories and then also as we find from 2nd Kings chapter 24 they joined with Nebuchadnezzar and attacked uh, Jehoiakim and so again God would deal with them and we see the fire in the wall of Rabba devouring the palaces verse 14 we come into chapter two, and the sixth nation is Moab, because he burned the bones of the king of Edom into lime. And again, from history, we know this was fulfilled, sure enough, when Tilgath Pileser conquered the Assyrian conquer of Moab. And again, we see fire upon Moab, it shall devour the palaces of Kiriath, and Moab shall die with tumult, with shouting, and with the sound of trumpet. So we see, brothers and sisters, these surrounding nations that Israel were found to be interacting with and, and dealing with would all be destroyed as a result of their wickedness and their immorality. The nation were completely surrounded on every side. And I think it's interesting when we think about this idea of, of the fire as I've kind of pulled out there in all six of these Hebrews chapter 12 talk, talk to us doesn't it about God being a consuming fire having prepared a, a kingdom which cannot be moved let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear for our God is a consuming fire to those who upon whom he'll have mercy he is a merciful God but to those who disobey him he is a God of of judgment and, and vengeance and so we see that here in the in the prophecy of Amos and I think as I said uh, we'd, we'd show this map again I think it's very interesting when you sort of visualize this prophecy a bit you see the prophecy that I've put there on the on the screen prophecy one was to the Syrians in the northwest northeast sorry Prophecy two was to the Philistines in the southwest. And the chapters and verses are there in the circles for you. The prophecy to Tyre in the northwest. The prophecy to Edom, which was the fourth one we looked at. The prophecy to Ammon, the fifth. The prophecy to Moab there, the sixth. And when you put it like that on a map, brothers and sisters, surely you see the fact that the nation of Israel were just completely surrounded 
this this circle of wickedness and immorality that we brothers and sisters find ourselves in exactly the same situation today don't we as i said earlier we we look around us and on every side we see the wickedness of man and so it's almost as if god starts the prophecy of amos in this way giving israel this this picture of their surroundings and almost says look israel you're surrounded and now it's time in chapter two now it's time we need to home in on you having dealt with the nations quite quickly two or three verses on each one god now proceeds to home in on his beloved people and the last part of chapter two and then indeed as you'll see with brother alan the next the next four chapters deal entirely with this prophecy to um, Israel. After a quick two verse interlude of looking at Judah, and again, chapter two, verse four to five, we see this um, this uh, reference to Judah. Amos's primary mission was to the northern kingdom of Israel, but nevertheless, we see this again was fulfilled. And again, fire used in judgment there in verse five. And, and in your own time, brothers and sisters, look at Hosea chapter 8 and Jeremiah chapter 17. And so lastly, he turns to Israel. And as I say, this will be the focus of your class with Brother Alan uh, next week, uh, God willing. But I think it's interesting just to look at one, one reference there in verse 10. Because he uses there this phrase, he says, I also I brought you up from the land of Egypt and led you 40 years through the wilderness to possess the land of the Amorite. And this is a phrase that is used um, again in in uh, Amos's prophecy. You see there in chapter three, verse one, at the end of the verse, he says, I brought you up from the land of Egypt, saying, you only have I known of all the families of the earth. Therefore, I will punish you for all your iniquities. And again, in chapter nine and verse seven. In the last chapter of the prophecy, he says in the middle of the verse, O Israel, have I not brought, the, brought Israel out of the land of Egypt? So we see God time and time again in this chapter. And as I've said there on the screen, he says the same thing five times in Hosea, the, the contemporary prophet of, of Amos. You can find those for yourself. This idea that God brought Israel up out of Egypt. He had chosen them to be his people and he delivered them from sin and death in Egypt into his promised land. And that's exactly the words he uses in Leviticus 11, isn't it? He says, I am the Lord that bringeth you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God. But there's something you need to do. You need to be holy, separate, because I am holy. Brothers and sisters, that's a lesson for us, isn't it? As we look outside and see us, in, as we've seen in chapter one of them, are surrounded by nations who are wicked and immoral we remember in chapter two that god brought israel out of the land of sin and death and delivered them into a promised kingdom and that's you and me brothers and sisters god willing in his plan and purpose with us as his spiritual nation of israel He has given us the opportunity to leave behind those nations and leave behind that land of sin and death and to cross through baptism the river into our promised land, the kingdom which he will deliver for us. And so may it be that each of us are found to be holy to him, separate from the world around us, just as he pleads with his people to be throughout history, throughout the whole of the Old Testament, that phrase, God delivered the people up out of the land of Egypt time and time again. He reminds them of that. And so, as I say, the focus of, the, of your next class, God willing, will be the rest of this this uh, message to his beloved nation of Israel. But I think it'd be nice just to finish the class with a final slide, just to kind of hopefully show that this book of, of Amos, although at first it might seem a, a message of, uh, as indeed it was to the children of Israel, a burden um, or, or a bit of a, a gloomy message, a gloomy prophecy in the sense of the waywardness of Israel and the judgments that God would bring. I think time and time again, brothers and sisters, as you can follow these verses as you go through your studies, you'll be reminded, hopefully every evening, that there are many things to be encouraged by in this book. 
that God's work with his people is encouraging for us, that we have a hope centred in our Lord and Saviour Christ Jesus and culminating in the last chapter there on in the bottom right hand corner in chapter nine, that one day he will raise up again the tabernacle of David and close up the breaches and will raise up his ruins and he will build it as it was in the days of old. And so hopefully, brothers and sisters, as I started the class, I said we would try and show those three areas. And, and hopefully you've seen that in the last 45 minutes or so. And you'll be able to bear these things in mind as you enjoy your studies in Amos for the next three weeks, God willing.